Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the next episode of The Backstory on the Shroud of Turin. If you haven't already done so, please visit GuyPowell.com and sign up for more episodes. I am the author of the upcoming book, The Only Witness, A History of the Shroud of Turin. It's a historical fiction tracing a possible history of the Shroud over the last two millennia. Today we'll be speaking with Russ Brialt. He's one of the preeminent experts on the Shroud. We'll be talking about a handful of topics and look forward to the discussion. But before we get started, I, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some of the references to the Shroud in the Bible. So in the Bible, there are really two mentions in the Gospels of the cloth lying in the tomb. There's one in John and one in Luke. Luke 24 verse 12 says, but Peter ran to the tomb. When he bent over to look inside, he saw only the linen cloth. A little bit different in John though, John 20 verse six, then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Funny, there's no mention, though, in, in uh, Mark nor in, uh, in Matthew. But there are a couple of potential hints in some of the other uh, books, and in particular, there's a possible mention of the cloth of, with the face on it in Paul, uh, in one of the writings from Paul in Galatians 3.1, You foolish Galatians! Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited as crucified. But it's, it is these writings, these biblical references, and that is what all the fuss is about. So with that, let me introduce uh, Russ Brialt. Russ has been researching and lecturing on the Shroud of Turin for over 30 years. His highly acclaimed presentation known as the Shroud Encounter makes use of over 200 images and unfolds like a CSI investigation. Awesome. Russ Brialt has presented to hundreds of uh, audiences from New York to Hawaii. He's appeared in nationally televised documentaries, including Mysteries of the Ancient World on CBS, Uncovering the Face of Jesus on the History Channel, and CNN's The uh, Finding Jesus. More importantly, though, and more dear to my heart, because I, I really like and appreciate the Museum of the Bible, he is the key consultant to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. for the development of a high-tech interactive exhibit on the Shroud opening in 2022. He's also been to three exhibitions, public exhibitions of the Shroud in Italy, and that's definitely something on my bucket list. He's a longtime member of the Shroud Science Group, which is an international consortium of scientists and scholars dedicated to the further research on the Shroud. And lastly, he is president and founder of the Shroud of Turin Education Project. And its mission is to advance the knowledge of the Shroud to a new generation. Russ, thank you so much for being here and so glad to have you. Let's get started. My pleasure, Guy. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. So uh, why don't you tell us uh, what your backstory is on how you got involved with the Shroud of Turin? Well, it's one of those things of being in the right place at the right time. And um, I was a uh, I was a writer for the college newspaper all the way back in 1980. And the um, and I had been following this 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 the Shroud of Turin research project went over to Turin in 1978. And a, a team of, of 33 scientists would, um, went over there. And, and of course, this is enormous news at the time. And I started hearing about it, reading newspaper clippings and stuff like that. And I was intrigued by it, but really didn't do anything with it. And until I was, and, and in 1980, um, I, uh, uh, National Geographic came out with a big article about it in June. So I asked if I could write some articles about it for the college newspaper. And they said, they gave me permission to do it. And uh, so I spent a lot of time reading books and magazines and newspaper articles and, and calling the scientists to get some quotes. And, and so my articles appeared in, in the two part series in fall of 1980. And by, the, by that time I was hooked. I mean, it says, man, this is one seriously cool mystery and nobody knows anything about it. And um, so then um, I had the uh, good fortune of being able to attend 
um, the the first United States Symposium on the Shroud in 1981, which was held at, at, at Connecticut College in New London. And that's when all the scientists that went to Turin in 78 uh, presented all their respective papers over a two day period. And I, I attended that and got to meet everybody and I just been involved ever since. Yeah, wow. So, because uh, I do remember in 1978, uh, something kind of very vague uh, about the shroud, and I said, "Oh, well, that's kind of interesting," you know. And I and I kind of you know squirreled it away and didn't do anything with it. And then, unfortunately, in 1988, then the radiocarbon dating came out, and I said, "Oh, well, you know what, you know what do you do then?" And and then I then I definitely uh, forgot about it. Uh, it, it, for me, it was about 15 years ago. Uh, my brother sent me one of Ian Wilson's books, The Blood in the Shroud. And that one I started reading. And, uh, and I don't know, I just like those factual books like that. And I read through the whole thing and I said, wow, this is really awesome. And, and so, you know, there is proof that, that this is really the authentic burial cloth of, of Jesus Christ. And from there, then I said, you know, this would be really interesting to write this as more of a, a story. And then that's where my uh, the concept and the genesis of my my book, uh, my upcoming book came from. Wonderful. So, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So uh, now you're uh, working with the uh, Shroud Science Group and then the Shroud of Turin Education Project. Tell us about those two organizations. Well, the Shroud Science Group is a consortium of, of scholars and scientists all over the world. And we collaborate by by email. It's just one of those Yahoo. I mean, uh, well, it's, it's Gmail now. It started off as Yahoo. And it's, uh, you know, it's a membership only. You have to be invited to join. And, and um, so there's a couple hundred of us on there worldwide. And, and you know, and we, we go on different topics. If someone asks a question and people chime in based on their expertise and we're working on new things. And, and so it's just a, just a great group to be a part of. Yeah, fantastic. And as far as the, as far as the Shroudatron Education Project, that's my own uh, corporation. I, I, um, I brand everything uh, Shroud Encounter. So like if you go to my, my website would be shroudencounter.com, um, but it would be on, it would be part of the Shroudatron Education Project. Yeah, yeah. And I was on the website. You've got some really fascinating stuff there and uh, uh, definitely worth a visit if you're interested. Shroud of shroudencounter.com shroudencounter.com right. so fantastic so um uh, tell us uh, what are some of the latest happenings findings that are going on with the shroud well you know there's there's a lot of work going on in terms of, of image theory as you know what could have caused the image you know i don't know for your for your viewers listeners um you know it, it, one of the things about the shroud we always have to remind ourselves that this is the most analyzed artifact in the world and was subjected to uh, hands-on analysis for five days continuously 120 hours and uh, you know working in shifts round the clock x-radiography infrared thermography photo microscopy x-radiography you know uh, photo spectroscopy i mean just a lot of a lot of tests and not to mention, you know, particle analysis, wet chemical analysis, blood analysis. And so one of the things that's really important to always bear in mind, you see, there's one of the one of the key things that was determined in 78 and then published in 81 was that there is no visible trace of any kind of paint, ink, dye, pigmentation or stain. There are no artistic substances on the cloth to account for the image. And then you have a whole pattern of blood stains. Well, is it just paint? Is it animal blood? Is it human blood? Is it blood from actual wounds? I mean, come on, if five days, 120 hours, it can't possibly be that hard to figure out whether something's the work of an artist or not, right? All it takes is a magnifying glass. Yep, there's the paint, boys, let's go. <laughs> and it's, um, but, you know, but things are not that easy. And, and they, they, you know, nothing's easy with the shroud. It's, um, and so what, what I always like to remind people is that there's always this constant either or proposition. And the Shroud of Turin either is the burial shroud of Jesus or it's not. And if it's not, well, then what is it? If it's not authentic, well, then it must be the work of an artist. It must be the work of some human effort 
either to perpetrate a fraud, uh, you know, to, you know, there, there has to be some process by which this alleged artist or fraudster uh, had, had, had created this. We can't determine a process. We haven't found it yet. And no one has duplicated it. And so, so this is really, really important because, uh, and this is the area that, that kind of gets me jazzed at the moment. And it's um, uh, in, in terms of what you're thinking about, you know, where things are going in terms of research. I'm focused on this notion, this either or proposition. And the Shroud's known history in Western Europe begins in 1356, when it, when it, when it is property of, of Geoffrey de Charnay, um, who was probably a descendant of the Knights Templar and the same Templar that was burned at the stake in, in 1314. And, um, and then, um, so the, um, I only got ahead of myself, but the point is, is that we have a fully documented history from 1356 on. Now, prior to 1356, the history is a little sketchy, which allows for, for the skeptics to say, aha, see, the shroud was fabricated right there in the mid 1300s. And that's, and so I'm saying to myself, okay, well then who's the artist? Who's the artist that perpetrated this incredible fraud? Now, when you, when you put that question out there, nobody has an answer. Walter McCrone has no answer. I mean, all of, this, all of the skeptics, none of them have a satisfactory answer. And this is important, is because, because if the shroud is the product of the 1300s, we should be able to know how it was done and who did it. And so I'll give you an example. Um, Walter McCrone claimed that he thought it was the artist Simone Martini. Now, Simone Martini was a very well-known 14th century artist. Um, and, and so he died in 1344. And so, so maybe it was Simone Martini. And then uh, there's this Shroud skeptic in, in uh, Baltimore who used to work for the, uh, it was the uh, director of the Walters Museum, uh, art, art, art Museum. He wrote a book. He thinks that well, oh, no, it's 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 not Simone Martini. It's it, somebody. It it must be the work the work of, of one of his students, Nato Cecchirelli. Whether if you were to compare their artworks, they're almost identical because you know because Cecchirelli learned from Martini anyways. So now here's the exercise. Okay, so if Nato Cecchirelli is the artist that allegedly crafted the shroud. Let's look at some of Cecciarelli's work. So I looked at a crucifixion scene uh, he painted. There is nothing remotely similar between Cecciarelli's crucifixion scene versus what we see on the shroud, nothing. In other words, Cecciarelli has the nail wounds in the palm, on the shroud, there was in the wrist. On the on the shroud, on, on, on Cecciarelli has the blood dripping straight down into you know straight down from the wound. On the shroud, it oozes down the arm, puddles at the elbow, and then drops down. You barely has any markings around the head for a crown of thorns, and yet on the shroud we clearly see scrapes and blood flows all around the head. You look at the side wound. Cecciarelli has the blood spurting out of the side as if it was a hose pipe. And yet on the shroud, we see that it oozes out because the because it's post-mortem blood, the blood, the pump is not pumping any the, the, the heart is not pumping anymore. So therefore it's not gonna spurt, it's just gonna ooze out, which is exactly what we see on the shroud, not to mention the separation of blood and blood serum, which is which proves that it's that this is post-mortem blood. So at, in, now on the on the Cecciarelli crucifixion. He, he's 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 completely clean in the front. On the shroud, you have scourge marks all over the front, uh, the, the chest, the thighs, the back. There is nothing that compares, and this is the best that the skeptics can offer. So all I'm saying is, what 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 jazzes me, what gets me excited, is the fact that okay, because again, I come back to this either or proposition. It either is or it isn't. And if it isn't, then who did it and how did he do it? 
and 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 both and both uh, Macron and Viken pose these artists as the likely candidates. It's ridiculous. So, anyways, that's that's some of the yeah. stuff I've been working on lately. <laughs> well, and you know, and you're so right too. Uh, you know, even in the Bible, the Bible says the Roman guard, you know, pierced him with the with the uh, the, the sword or, uh, and uh, the spear rather, and uh, he was dead. That was proof that he was dead. So if he's dead, then the blood is not going to spurt out. So right there, that that image that uh, that he painted is, you know, got one falsehood to it. And the other thing that's interesting too is if they painted this, or if, if a man painted this, where are all of their practice paintings? So where did they practice painting in reverse? Because uh, the shroud image is a reverse image. It's not a normal image, it's a reverse image. And uh, so they would have had, I was in the Chagall Museum in Southern France and and, uh, uh, and I, I don't know, I made a mistake and I, I didn't realize that the center room had all the really good paintings and all the outside were all the drafts. And I'm <laughs> looking at all these drafts and stuff and I'm going, oh, these are kind of good, but man, I thought he was a better painter than this. And then finally I turn left into the center and I go, oh, there it is. But what I, my point is though, that all of those artists had practices so where are all the practice elements of, of, of painting the shroud, painting the body, and painting it in reverse in, in a negative as opposed to a positive? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. You know, they obviously don't exist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They don't exist. And if you were, and if you did one painting like that, then, uh, and if it was that good, and it had all of that stuff in it, why wouldn't you have painted more? You would have, you know, you could have painted other things. How could it just be this one thing that that showed up? Right. The other thing, the other thing that I uh, I don't know, you know, um, there's there's what you know you call prehistory, and then there's history, and history is kind of the written when when there was writing, and so when something gets written down, then that's part of history, so to speak. And uh, you know, so in this case, the writing, uh, something being written down of uh, De Charny displaying or having the, the shroud took place in 1350s or so, I can't remember the date you said. Um, but what about all the other evidence that is quasi written down? You know, you have then the coins, you have the Pantocrator paintings, you've got the, um, you know, you've got the uh, the Prey manuscript and things like that. Uh, you know, so what, what about those things? Well, um, it, it, let's 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 back that up because again, the shroud has a documented history in Western Europe in France in 1356. That doesn't mean that's when it originated. Now, now the skeptics would like to allege that, but that's not but that's not the case. Now, the historical evidence at this point is pretty solid that the shroud was in Constantinople in 1204 and stolen during the Fourth Crusade. Now, the Fourth Crusade was a disaster. I mean, it should have never happened. And, and of course, the Latin Crusaders went nuts when they got into the city and stole everything, all the silver, all the gold, all the ivory, and all the relics of the saints. And, and there's several references to the shroud being in Constantinople. Uh, not to mention the fact that the that the that the emperor wrote a letter of protest uh, uh, to the pope, uh, Pope Innocent III. This is in 1205, and complained about 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 the Venetians and the French looting their city and 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 most and stealing everything and most sacred of all the linen which 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 wrapped our Lord after his death and before the uh, the resurrection. Which, which, and he says, which is now in Athens. Mm. So he tells about the cloth that was sto stolen and tells us where it was taken to. And then, um, and so then you have the 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 eyewitness account of of uh, of the crusader chronicler uh, Robert de Clary, who who sees the shroud there in the in in Saint Mary's of Blackenay, right there in, in Constantinople, and sees it that every Friday it's lifted up. You know, so people can see the image of the Lord, and it was, um, you know, it was lifted up gradually. It, it was, it was, a, it was a, um, a liturgical thing, um, where lifted up a little bit represented Jesus as a as as a, as a child. Lifted up a little bit more, Jesus as a as an adolescent, 
you know, a little bit more. Finally, all the way up, Jesus as the crucified Lord. And this would be at 6 a.m., 6 9 a.m., noon, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Four different, uh, three, of course, is the same time in which Jesus died and gave up. And um, so, so clearly there's a shroud in, Constanti in, in Constantinople. And it's, um, and, and De Clary's reference talks about the image of the Lord on this cloth. So we know that it's not just a cloth, it has cloth with an image on it, full body image. And so where did it go? And um, so you mentioned the Prey Manuscript. This is really a key document. This is the smoking gun document. And the, um, the Hungarian Prey Manuscript is the uh, first book ever bound in the Hungarian language, bound in, by, in approximately uh, 1192. And it deals with the history of Hungary and it's um and in it are some are some picture codexes which are just fine line drawings and there are under the scenes of the crucifixion you know jesus on the cross jesus being taken down from the cross jesus being laid out under the linen shroud jesus being wrapped in his linen shroud so there's like like multiple scenes like this well in the in the scenes where we have jesus laid out on the linen shroud what do we see we see a man with four fingers, no thumbs. It's exactly what we see on the shroud. We see a man with long hair, full beard. That's what we see on the shroud. Um, we see um, there are, in, in, especially when you, know, when you when you look at the at the bottom, uh, uh, the picture. It's like in two scenes. A scene of a is a top scene and a bottom scene. In the bottom scene is the one where he's wrapped in the shroud. What's the shape of the shroud? It's a long rectangular cloth with the body enveloped lengthwise, exactly as we see on the shroud. The shroud is 14 feet long, three and a half feet wide, a long rectangular cloth. We see now very, in, very important here is that the shroud was in a fire in 1532. It's kept in a silver box, top of the box melted, blob of molten silver fell down onto it burning all the way through it, creating this origami burn pattern, which you see even today. And the image lies in between those scorch marks and burns. Well, but there's also another burn incident that occurred and was probably in Constantinople, probably some kind of a liturgical service where the cloth was folded up on the altar and the bishop, the cardinal, was going around the altar to a table with a with a with a censer with hot coals in it. We think there was kind of an accident, where it was an oops moment, and these and these hot coals fell onto the cloth, burning all the way through it, creating a very distinctive L-shaped pattern of burns. Okay, it's very distinctive. Well, we know that those burns occurred prior to the 1532 fire. Now, how do we know that? because we have a copy of the shroud painted in 1516 that is in Lear, Belgium. And so, and, and so we know that, though, that those are two separate burn incidents. It just so happens that this, that this picture uh, in this Hungarian prey manuscript picks up those L-shaped pattern of burns and also picks up the very um, unique um, zigzag pattern lines which, which would, um, su which would uh, characterize the um, the uh, herringbone pattern weave of the shroud. I mean, this the, this is enormous because the artist who who saw the shroud and painted it in that picture was an eyewitness to what was in Constantinople somewhere between 1163 and 1170. So that's a that's already a hundred years older than the oldest carbon date of 1260. And it didn't just get there in 1260, it got there in 944 and when they had retrieved it from Edessa. And so the, the significance of the Hungarian Prey Manuscript cannot be um, minimized at all, is because it, it definitively proves that the shroud was in Constantinople. This is enormous because the, because the carbon date date range that, that was given by the three labs is 1260 to 1390. So everyone's looking for a 14th century artist. Sorry, boys, you're looking in the, in the you're looking in the wrong century, you know. If um, so, the the cloth was clearly in Constantinople, and which which what does it mean? It means this that the carbon dating is wrong. Period. 
End of story. I don't know how old the shroud is. I can't tell you it's first century, but I can sure tell you that that 1260 to 1390 date range is flat wrong. There's definitely, exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, and I think one of the problems too that the, uh, the anti-shroudists kind of bring up is that why is there nobody writing or no evidence of the shroud, especially let's say from 1204 of the fourth crusade, that time period all the way to the 1300s. Well, um, if somebody stole the shroud and Pope Innocent III found out about it, he was going to excommunicate them. Right. So if I have that shroud, I'm not telling anybody. And so he, he or they, whoever then took it or borrowed it or appropriated it, then has got to keep it in hiding. And until maybe uh, Innocent III dies or some of the other ones die, and then only then would you start to make it uh, known that, hey, I've got this really cool cloth. It is the shroud you know, of Turin and we took it from whatever. And of course, then there's deaths and you know the original taker died or whatever. And somehow it got over to uh, Jeffrey de Clary. Um, uh, what, what? No, it's not de Clary. It's the uh, uh, Jeffrey de Vergy, I think. What is his uh, name? You're talking, okay, you're talking, uh, Jeffrey de Charnay. Yeah, Jeffrey de Charnay, that's right. And um, who, who married Jean de Vergy, yeah, who was probably yeah. the owner of the shroud. Yeah, yeah. And she was then, uh, and so it, for me, I, I kind of see it as being Othon de la Roche. He went, yes. he went into um, into Constantinople as part of the uh, the crusade. He took it and probably a bunch of other stuff as part of his spoils. He was also then named the Duke of Athens. Yes. And, and eventually he retires and goes home and brings it with him. And then, uh, you know, uh, Marguerite de, Ch de Charny and Geoffrey de Vergy, I always get those two confused then they they marry and somehow then that then now starts to produce a historical line where that shroud has now got written history as opposed to kind of circumstantial evidence and you know it's funny when i think about when i think about you know sitting in front of a jury and i've got you know the defense attorney and i got the prosecutor yes it's the authentic no it's not the authentic and and all of this quasi i mean i don't call it circumstantial evidence i i think that evidence of the prey manuscript and um, and then the the pantocrator and then the coins the uh, the Roman coins are all documented evidence that that shroud existed and was uh, was known prior to that date of 1260 from the radiocarbon dating. I absolutely agree with you. Um, there's uh, there's a reason why all of the orthodox representations of Jesus all suddenly change in the sixth century. Um, you look at representations of Jesus prior to that, um, and even in the catacombs, they're, they're all over the board. You have short hair, clean shaven, short hair, but with a full beard. He's looking off to the left, he's looking off to the right. But then, uh, but then sixth century comes along, always front facing, always long hair, full beard, large hollow eyes, flattened nose, stylistically very similar to what we see on the shroud. Why? Because that's when the true likeness was uh, was revealed. The true likeness, also known as the image of Edessa, also known as the Mandelian cloth. You know, it's, <laughs> we have a long history here, so it kind of goes through 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 different characterizations. Um, but it was originally known as the true likeness of Christ, not made by human hands, and that not not made by human hands. This this notion that it's an archaeopoetus image. Um, it means that that harkens back to the second commandment of to not make any graven image. And it's almost like they were saying, we didn't do it. We don't know who did it, but we did not do this. And, and, um, and so, and so that's, uh, you know, so it, it, it's, it really is, you know, tremendously fascinating. And, uh, and you're right. I mean, I think that that is, um, it, 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 it speaks to the, the the shroud being in existence in the sixth century and then then you got the whole legend of Abgar in the first century where you know at, at, at the uh, 
Here Abgar is dying of leprosy and yep. sends a messenger down to Jerusalem where, where Jesus is. And, and the fame and knowledge was all over Syria at the time. It says so, Matthew 424. It says that it says that the knowledge of, of Jesus was all over Syria and people were and come people were coming to him to be healed of their various illnesses and diseases. And um, so if Abgar was indeed sick. He would have known about Jesus, and 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 because it's right on the trade routes between the uh, on the on on the Silk Road in between the Near East and the Far East, people would have been coming back and forth and talking about all the stuff going on down there in Jerusalem. And here Abgar is dying of leprosy. It says, "Man, I got to get in on this." And so he sends a messenger down there to ask Jesus to come to Edessa to bring healing to him. And obviously, Jesus had other plans. Um, but he sends his messenger back and, um, and, um, along with the apostle Jude Thaddeus and, um, who, uh, I, I think is Jude of, of the, of, you know, one of the, one of the 12, I, I don't think that, uh, that Jesus would have dispatched, or in this case, Jesus had, by the time Jude w- went there, Jesus wrote, um, dictated a letter back to be, to be returned to the king saying that later on you know he would send a messenger he would send one of his one of his followers and um and so when uh, when jude and simon the uh simon the zealot not simon peter uh when they trekked off to evangelize syria i believe probably the first place they went to would be edessa to honor the request of the king mm. and um and so and um so and later, I have a little bit of a different twist on the history there in terms of my interpretation of it. Um, a lot of people think, you know, think that that Jude would have taken the cloth with him at that point in time. I don't think so. I think he went there to uh, basically evangelize and to heal the same way everybody else did all throughout the known world with the, with the, with the laying on of hands. Let me tell you, Jude did not need the shroud for healing. He had that anointing. They all had that anointing. Everywhere they went, people were healed. He did not need the shroud as a prop or as a tool for healing. Hmm. So he healed them with just like this, like he healed everybody else with the the, the, the laying on of hands. And then um, Abgar is healed. He becomes a fervent believer. And then, and then at some, and then, and then uh, Jude is, is allowed to preach to the people there in Odessa. Hundreds, if not thousands, get converted. Um, the record shows that, they, that that over the course of time, about sixty thousand people got converted in Syria through the ministry of of uh, Jude and and and, and Simon the uh, the zealot. The um, so, anyways, my theory is at some point. Jude and Simon return to Jerusalem. Regroup. Let's get back t- together with our fellow apostles and share notes. And and then this was probably prior to 44 AD, because that um, and then that's when Agrippa died. And and uh, but at any rate, um, I think things were really heating up. Persecution was getting hot, mm-hmm. and and I think that they didn't didn't know they knew that they had to get this cloth out of Jerusalem it would have been destroyed and and so I I envision this scene where all the apostles are gathered in the upper room or some room and there's Jude in the back and says raises his hand and says I've got an idea yeah I just came back from Edessa we I we have a we have a king who got who is a believer He's a king of a fortified city, a walled city. I mean, it said, you know, let me bring it back to Edessa. I know that Abgar would take care of it. So you see, I believe personally, just logically speaking, you know, I'm just thinking through this rationally, that that Jude probably went back out to Syria, went back to Edessa, and presented the cloth to Abgar, which is which is why the writings of, of, of Asubius, the, the church historian who was, who was transcribing the documents in the record office of Edessa circa 325, there's no reference to an image on, there's no reference to a cloth with an image, you see, because, because, because I don't think it was associated with the healing of Abgar. 
I think um, I think Abgar was healed with the laying on of hands, and then the second time, uh, Jude brought the cloth to him for safekeeping. That's just my little twist on the um, on the on the history. And, yeah. And, well, and, and uh, you know, and having to get it out of Rome or the Roman-controlled areas uh, was pretty critical. Uh, you know, you have certainly there's a lot going on. You have the Jews uh, and the you know the hierarchy of the Jews going after these proto-Christians, and uh, and then the, these proto-Christians, which are mostly Jews, are saying, "Hey, we can't show an icon because that's against our religion." Because at that time they thought it was against it, so they didn't want to show it. And uh, but but yet the the twelve, to your point, knew that this was the such a valuable cloth not only did it have this image on it however it got there but it had his blood on it Amen. and so then it had to get out of uh, the the potential uh you know conflict that might have been coming you know when you get into the 70 a.d then it's probably really close so it had to have gotten out of there uh, before that in order to be protected and yeah. i think that was whoever was in charge of it at that point realized it had to have gotten out of there uh, then so yeah um all right well yeah, fantastic i mean i could go on and i know you could too and uh this it excites me to talk about it a lot but so uh tell us about what's going on at museum of the bible man february 26th opening opening date um anyone listening watching you gotta go it's uh you don't have to be there on the 26th of february that's just an opening conference uh, uh i'll be there speaking a couple others will be there but um it'll it'll go from it'll be open from february 26th to the end of july and um so washington is a beautiful city to go visit all the smithsonian's and the the whole you know national mall and all the all all of the monuments but man museum of the bible is the third largest museum in the city 400,000 square feet, six stories high, state of the arts, gorgeous. And it's, um, and so we've been working with the museum um, over three years now uh, to develop an exhibit on the shroud. And it's finally opening. I've been an advisor to it and it's um, very excited about it. This is, this is a million dollar exhibit. So uh, you guys are gonna be interactive uh, consoles and displays. It's uh, you. You walk into it and you feel like you're walking into a church. The way that they have it set up, you know. And they have five different sections that that you go into. That that you as you, as you walk through and eight interactive types of of uh, of, of displays. And um, so it's uh, it's going to be awesome. It's it, it, it's it's going to be the best thing ever done on the shroud today in terms of in terms of exhibits and it's um so um so you gotta go some of you this is a this is you know make your make your summer trip this year to washington dc and go see this exhibit can't agree more i've been to the uh, museum of the bible four times uh each time probably two or three hours and uh, i still haven't seen everything no I, it is just so uh, the, the whole museum is great and then uh, I am going up uh, for the 26th, and so we're going to meet face to face then. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, and I, but I'm also going up on the 23rd, and there's I'll be there of, too. Oh, okay. So we'll see. I'll see you there on the 23rd, <laughs> and <laughs> so definitely looking forward to it. It's an awesome. Uh, the, the museum is definitely top class. Uh, they have put so much good material in there. They have some really great stuff. And, uh, and then when I heard that they were doing this exhibit on the shroud, I was like just overjoyed. And so uh, definitely looking forward to, uh, to being up there and seeing it and, 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 and getting involved in that. So uh, fantastic. I'm so glad you're involved in it. That's really great. We'll get to, uh, we'll get to meet face to face, even though we both live here in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's very exciting. Yeah, it really is. So um, unfortunately, we're about out of time. So, uh, but is there anything else you'd like to uh, mention before we close? And otherwise, we'll uh, we'll we'll sign off here. Uh, I'd say if anyone has a has a, a church or a, a school that they're interested in, you know, like I said, I do a I do a ninety minute shroud encounter. It's uh, man, it's it's fast moving, uh, and it takes you th uh, all the way through from the beginning to the end, and and it's um, so. Uh, go to shroudencounter.com and you can find out more about what I do and and um, so and um, in the uh, 
hey, guy, you since we live here in Atlanta, we need to get together and um, and 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 do a little, you know, lunch sometime. So absolutely. Uh, the uh <laughs> yeah so. no we're glad to let's do that uh okay. we're not that far away well after we uh, well, we'll we'll see each other in february and then we'll make plans to uh to do that when well uh, in our uh, defense the atlanta metro area is about 100 miles in in diameter so it's 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 not yep. like it's just across town you know yep. So. Yep. <laughs> yep and i'm i'm on the north side i think you're on the south right. side so. right exactly yeah yeah exactly so uh, anyway uh thank you russ really really appreciate it. it's been awesome I definitely appreciate your time and please go to uh, shroudencounter.com. There is some really good stuff out there. I was out there the last couple of days and uh, amazed at how much material you put into that into that site. And uh, uh, otherwise, uh, please stay tuned for many other videos in this series on the backstory of the Shroud of Turin. And please visit my site, guypowell.com and sign up for more episodes. Thank you, Russ. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Guy. Appreciate it.